It's the British Open, the last big sporting shooting test of the summer. We bring you the competition final. I'm not one for standing out there in the minus weather shooting clays. How do you get permission? Nicole Moore is out after a buck and explains how she does it. I'm ringing them to help them. Um, and that's the, the first thing that I get across. It's not, oh, I've seen those pigeons, I want to shoot them all. We have a Metropolitan Police officer facing the music about firearms licensing. Ian Hodge talks about night vision. Competition is for this solar-powered trail cam from iZika. Meredith brings you the news on the news stump and James Marchington showcases the best hunting and shooting videos in Hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Browning shooter Sam Green topped off a memorable 2023 clay season by winning the British Open Sporting Championship at the beginning of September, on top of the world sporting title he won at E.J. Churchill just a couple of months ago. The British is a real test of stamina as well as skill. It's the one they say you have to win three times. First, you must qualify on the 120-bird course during the week. That gets you into the 75-bird final on Sunday morning. If you make it through that one, you're into the pressure cooker of a six-man superfinal held in front of a big crowd where a single slip could cost you the prestigious title. Just over 1,100 shooters entered to tackle the qualifying course over the four days. They knew they'd be facing some of the hardest targets in the business, with course setter Steve Lovett renowned for testing shooters with extreme angles, distance and speed. This one lived up to expectations with tricky combinations of pairs, Targets skimming across a lake like flat stones, distant batus, and even one launched from a brand new trap that's said to throw a clay at more than 100 miles an hour. My roots is sporting shooting. I love the good old fashioned English sporting rounds. Um, we don't see them very often nowadays. It's all gone a bit modern and 3D, but this shot really well. 15 stands in the week of completely different targets. And if somebody had a weakness, it showed it up. But you know, I've had numerous loads of messages on my phone this week from C and B class shooters saying what a fantastic week they've had so several of the top names shot on the first day but dropped out of contention with only the top five in each class and top three in each category going through to Sunday's final. Sam Green shot early on the Wednesday scoring a superb 110 out of 120. Later in the day Tom Young topped his score by one but Sam's place in the final was secure with Toby Reid, Phil Gray and Richard Bunning joining him on Sunday's squad list. Former champion George Digweed failed to qualify in his class with a 103, but made it to the final in the veterans category. Among the qualifiers was a strong contingent of Ely shooters. The cartridge manufacturer's Tony Bromwich was there to support them. So what shells do you use when you're facing the worst that Steve Lovett can throw at you? In terms of sponsor shooters, most of them are using, well, it's a, a variety of cartridges. So really from our Superbs, uh, which is a very versatile uh, cartridge. VIP federations are also popular and people have also been using the, the titanium cartridge. So those are probably the three main cartridges that, that we've seen being used today. But, you know, uh, there's been a wide range of the, uh, of the Ely range. As the week went on, the squad list for Sunday morning steadily filled up. James Atwood jumped to the top of the leaderboard on day two, shooting a superb 116 out of 120. His score remained unbeaten until the end, despite strong challenges from the likes of Andrew McEwen shooting 115 and Nick Hendrick 114. For the British, making the final is just the first hurdle though. How you got there no longer matters. With scores reset to zero, it's all to play for. It was here that Sam really shone, missing just two targets to score a phenomenal 73 out of 75. That put him in the lead going into the six-man super final. Sam can't afford a single slip, with Suffolk junior Will Page just one behind. Jack Lovick and James Bradley Day are snapping at his heels on 71. Stuart Clark and Philip Thorold complete the final six. Both are experienced shots more than capable of making up a three-target gap. The pressure builds as the six super finalists shoot first one stand and then the next. With Sam holding the lead, he's last to shoot on the final stand. It all hangs on those last few targets. He holds it together and there's a tense wait as the CPSA team double check the scores. 
So Sam Green is the winner with Highcom with a score of 90. But yes, he's won, and by a comfortable margin, he's over the moon. It's been the perfect end of the, the perfect year, really. Again, with the Browning Crown, um, yeah, an, another championship to his name. So, uh, yeah, it's a fantastic gun. So, yeah, so for me, this is the last competition of the year. Um, so now I'll go back onto some game shooting um, to have a bit of chill time for the winter. I'm not one for standing out there in the minus weather shooting clays. Um, so, yeah, just have a bit of chill time now. Um, and then it'll be sort of well, roll soon roll round to the Essex Masters again. So and that'll be the start of the season again for me. For full results, see the CPSA website, cpsa.co.uk. For more about Browning guns, go to browning.eu. And for Ely cartridges, it's elyhawklimited.com. Now, we gave away a Muck Boots Calder Boot price at £135, Stu Field Sports Nation member Dave Smith this week. This week's competition is for this iZeka solar-powered trail cam, and more about the iZeka on our Field Tester channel, link below. You can win it by joining the Field Sports Nation and watching their special Tuesday night show, Field Sports Extra, link to that below too. What is the Field Sports Nation? Here is Jeff Garrard to explain. I mean, we are under attack. We are under constant attack from people that just wants to ban our way of life. And some of the people don't really understand what they're doing or they don't realise the consequences are going to be of their actions. So we need to stand up. We need to stand up and fight. The Field Sports Channel is a good way of doing that. The Field Sports Community is a good way of doing that. And for everyone that's out there that goes out hunting live quarry, you need to be part of an organisation um, that will help us, that will help us defend our sport. Um, I've had a good, enjoyable life from field sports and I want my son to carry on that life, you know? So we have to, we have to um, get out there and we have to fight it. Don't just sit back and let other people do it. Get out there, you know, put your hand up, put your head above the parapet and defend our way of life. Thanks to all of you who have joined so far and who have donated to our Poke Packham fundraiser. Links to all the ways you can help in the run-up to our 6th November court date with BBC TV's Chris Packham below. Next, our own Justice sitting there with her scales. It's Meredith on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. You are watching Field Sports Channel News. The RSPB are hypocrites, that's the accusation from the Countryside Alliance. A week after accusing government ministers of telling lies about its commitment to the environment, the Bird Charity released a hard-hitting message on social media featuring images of Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and ministers Michael Gove and Theresa Coffey. The word liars is emblazoned across their faces, highlighting government shortcomings on environmental issues. In response, the Countryside Alliance points out that the RSPB has close ties with United Utilities, which was named the UK's worst polluting water company last year. And if the RSPB are going to use their platforms to call out others, it needs to address the massive elephant in the room, United Utilities, and use its platforms to condemn them. And until such a time that it calls out others, but not United Utilities, the RSPB are very much open to the accusation of hypocrisy. The Scottish Government needs to rethink its approach to conservation. The new director of Basque in Scotland, Peter Clark, says the Scottish Government's push towards protecting the environment could instead lead to the decimation of the rural economy. He believes the push for carbon neutrality in Scotland is what's driving the Government's approach. You know, the, the rural economy survives on shooting and conservation and, you know, constituents of theirs will work in the sector and have jobs in the sector and we always frame it from that point of view that if you remove shooting conservation or our ability to whether it's manage grouse moors effectively or carry out predator control or operate lowland shoots if you remove that from the rural economy there isn't anything left you know the rural economy in scotland is a very fragile economy and we, there are no viable alternatives. You know, when you look at other sources of employment across rural Scotland, they just do not stack up on the job figures. There's a sort of drive to meet net zero targets. And um, we see that through the Butte House Agreement with the partnership with the Scottish National Party and the Green Party, that there's this um, very strong drive toward net zero targets. And we don't dispute that. We, we want to see 
um, the effects of climate change um, reduced. We want we want to be part of that, but we are part of that solution. And I think that's where the government needs to understand that. I think what we'd say to the Scottish government is to take a step back and realise where is the actual work being done? It's being done in the countryside. It's already being done. Support these people to continue that work. Support the land managers, the gamekeepers, farmers, etc., who all have a sort of shooting conservation background. Keep supporting them to do that because we are this. We are the solution to the problem. We're not the problem. The European Commission has announced a rethink on the conservation status of wolves. It announces that there is significant concern for the safety of wildlife due to the resurgence of these apex carnivores. Wolf populations have expanded from their strongholds in Poland. The animals are now frequently seen in forested areas as far west as the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg. EU President Ursula von der Leyen stated that wolves now pose a tangible threat to both livestock and humans. She has called on local and national authorities to take necessary action. The president's sentiments are personal as well, as she lost her pony Dolly to a wolf attack at her home in Western Germany last year. The former leader of Lambeth Council is the new shadow DEFRA secretary. Steve Reid MP assumes the role following a reshuffle. Reid is the MP for Croydon North and was formerly the Justice Minister. He replaces the Oldham MP Jim McMahon in the role. A new film released by South Africa's Conservation Imperative explores the role played by hunters in safeguarding wildlife. The South African Hunters Group says it is constantly working with scientists, wildlife groups and researchers to secure habitats for South Africa's wild creatures. It points out that hunting funds private conservation initiatives which in turn support rural economies in the country. If wildlife doesn't work for the people of that area and is of no value to them, the people will then decide, well, how can we generate benefits? So they will probably just eat the wildlife once they finished with that, cut down the bush, turn it into a form of agriculture, maybe run their livestock. I think ultimately that's not a win for anyone. More and more these days we are starting to understand what is known as regenerative science, so the regenerative management of the planet. So if your management principles are not sustaining life cycles, water cycles, things like that, you're out of line. We're looking at conservation from ecological sustainability, economic sustainability and then social sustainability. Now all three aspects of that conservation are equally as important. So sustainable principles of off-takes is very important. Are you generating the right revenue from your wildlife resource? What it's actually worth? And where's that revenue being spent? So as long as it's going back into sustaining the systems, the societies around it and adding value. And that in essence is basically what we would call growing the wildlife economy. There's a link for you to watch the rest of that film below. Nature Spy has hit back after social media posts falsely accused the company of not supporting shooting. The UK-based tech company supplies field sports equipment including trail cameras and thermal imaging kits. It says it has fallen victim to a social media campaign which says it won't sell equipment to organisations trying to protect native UK red squirrels by controlling greys. Technical director James O'Connell tells Field Sports News Nature Spy is in favour of humane grey squirrel control and always has been. The row began after Nature Spy was linked to an ongoing police investigation into the alleged inhumane dispatch of grey squirrels. The UN has revealed its estimated cost of invasive species across the globe. Researchers from 49 countries have spent the last four years measuring the impact of non-native invaders. Species such as grey squirrels, American signal crayfish, Japanese knotweed and invasive grasses contribute to the demise of wildlife and damage livestock. The report says the invaders have quadrupled worldwide every decade since the 1970s and now cost $423 billion a year. Basque announces a special prize for its annual autumn draw. This William Powell 12-bore 28-inch Viscount shotgun is priced at £13,000. Details of how to enter the competition to win it below. And finally, this is an odd one. This seeker shot in the Scottish Highlands has unusual palmated antlers, but that's not all. It seems to have both male and female parts. As you can see, it has teats like a hind, but male bits too. Maybe it's nature providing the ideal solution for the Scottish Government so you can shoot it all year round. 
You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, Meredith. If you prefer Meredith to David, please click like. And if you like David, please also click like. Thank you. Next, Nicole Moore explains how to get permission to shoot on the ground. Nicole Moore, better known on Instagram as shooting girl with an afro, has got a new perm. No, not that sort of perm. She's checking out a new stalking permission not far from her home in Norfolk. She's not expecting to shoot an animal today. This trip is about learning the lie of the land and working out where the deer are most likely to be found. It's the tail end of the row rut, so she has brought her rifle just in case. It's a Ticker 243 and she uses Sacco 100 grain soft point ammo. Nicole seems to have more luck than most in finding new permissions. She follows a proven method and it works. What's her secret? The first step is always finding the land, you know, um, finding land that works for you and, and what you're looking for. So I found the land here because of pigeons. I went out in the car, I, I did my reconnaissance, I made a little list on Google Maps of, of problem fields I found. And then I looked for farms nearby and just started ringing, you know, I even popped into a local pub and and said, oh, you see that field over there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you know who owns it by any chance? Which worked. And I rang the farmer. I've been to farms and knocked on kind of barns that have been converted into Airbnbs. And the residents have said, oh, there's this lady that sorts out the Airbnb. You can ring her. And then I've rang her and she's put me on to someone else. So, you know, it does take some effort, but it's not a lot of effort. And the reward is, is worth it. Yeah. I feel like I'm quite old fashioned um, in my approach and people don't expect someone that looks as young as me. <laughs> I'm not that young, but, um, you know, someone who's female, who's relatively young, um, who they expect to be kind of just sat on their computer all day to come and knock on doors and um, bring bottles of wine and, you know, um, and just have a general chat and, and share stories. and. Quite often, I'm doing a lot of that before I get the permission. So I've, I do the phone calls, I do the knocking on doors. We have just chats, we swap stories. And that allows the landowner to understand my experience, um, get a feel for my demeanour. I feel like half the battle is building rapport. You know, these people have to trust you at the end of the day. You're wandering around on, on their land without them. And when you have that initial phone call with the farmer, is it awkward? Is it like sort of, you know, you're a double glazing salesman or something? <laughs> well, funnily enough, my background uh, for years was kind of corporate sales and marketing, right. um, dealing with kind of global clients. So um, I suppose I have got the patter down quite naturally. Um, but no, I think the, the key thing that I always bear in mind when I'm picking up the phone is I'm ringing them to help them. Um, and that's the, the first thing that I get across. It's not Oh, I've seen loads of pigeons, I want to shoot them all. It's, you've got a problem on your land, your crop is getting decimated, have you got someone looking after that for you? If they have, no problem, on I go. I, I'll still introduce myself and say, obviously, if you want to keep my number for future, great. Um, and if they haven't, then I just say, well, are you happy to meet me and, and take it from there? And sometimes they have got people looking after the land and they're not doing the job well enough. Yeah. So then I still get a, a look in. You're just, you know, you're trying to keep the farmer happy, build up a good relationship, which is what I've done. Um, and after doing that, um, he has introduced me to the gamekeeper who has um, control of the shooting rights across the whole estate. So um, pigeons, I'm only shooting on 1,400 acres. Um, I now have access to, I believe it's 9,000 acres, um, the estate, bar a little section that's um, held back for a syndicate. So, yeah. Wonderful. So I've only been here maybe three or four times in search of deer since I got the permission, so which was only a handful of weeks ago. And what I've mainly seen is roe. I know there's muntjac here, um, and I know there's Chinese water deer here. Um, obviously, the gamekeeper's kind of filled me in. He's got his cameras out um, everywhere. Um, all I've seen is roe. Um, what I'd like today is roe, ideally, but obviously if I... Um, see a muntjac, I'll take it. Yeah. 
Chinese are out of season, you're saying, so they're not on the cards. Yeah, they're not on the cards today, but they're still wonderful to watch because they're beautiful. And quite often you tend to find them around the row as well. So if I do spot one, I will keep an eye on that area um, because there probably will be a row not far behind. Just within half an hour of being here, the amount of hares I've seen running around everywhere, and they're huge and the colouring is gorgeous. And um, I've already seen a couple of row butterflies everywhere, meadow browns that I haven't seen <laughs> for ages. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, buzzards, just, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Sit it out for an hour or so in my little den that I've made. Hope the rain doesn't get any worse. <laughs> Um, yeah, and see what we can spot. You can follow Nicole on Instagram, link below, and to her blog post with more tips about getting shooting permission. Thanks, Nicole. And Nicole is the subject of a podcast we put out this week from my chat with her on stage at the Cartagena's Game Fair Theatre in July, link below. Next, I had three coppers on the stage there too to grill them about firearms licensing. One of them, Chris Downs from the Met, made a strong case for how firearms licensing was a mess during COVID, but is getting better. You may agree or you may disagree with him. Here's what he had to say. Ladies and gentlemen, hello, I'm Chris. 23 years as a police officer, I've done all sorts of bits and bobs um, within that role and had a great time. This for me is a brilliant role. Please, if you bear with me, I'll try and tell you about and give you some reassurance about what we're doing here. Um, so, it's really hard to compare forces real different set of challenges and you know i appreciate for the licensing community turnaround time is a big thing absolutely what's really important for me and for all of you in a slightly different sense is that the quality of our work is right we have unfortunately seen some tragedies where the quality of our work hasn't been good and they cause a big impact on the shooting community my biggest challenge at the moment is around grant of new certificates. There's a very long story behind it, but during COVID, we weren't able to go out and visit people face to face as is required. And that took us away from our work for about a 16 month period. When we reopened the grant facility, we got our usual 16 months worth of demand in month number one. And then we got our usual monthly demand every month after that, which is a real challenge in all honesty. Firearms licensing isn't the most difficult part of policing, but it's also got a number of subtleties and complexities to it. So it's very difficult for me to just pick a number of staff members and try and drop them into it. So it has taken us some time. We've made some good progress around our turnaround times, we are now much more towards the eight month ish level for a new grant and we're working on moving that better and improving that again by the end of this year. Chris, can I just pick you up on that? Just, just two things. I mean, two little things within that. Some forces didn't have that problem. I mean, some force, Lincolnshire, for example, has been pretty good all the way through. And there was, could you, would you acknowledge there was a communication problem to the shooting community about how firearms licensing worked during that time. It seemed to be that basically the office door got locked and then it got reopened after COVID and you were, as you say, faced with all these applications. So that's not strictly speaking true. Very different for, like I say, for very difficult to compare forces. I benefit from my force in that I have a number of warranted officers, police officers available to me, but as you'll agree, COVID, a time of national panic, lots of uncertainty. So 50% of my team were redeployed to the streets. Other forces might have had a civilian workforce that weren't similarly impacted on that. But that's what caused us some of our issues, our workload around renewals, variation, well, variations we took a pause on, but our renewals absolutely maintained, not a problem at all. It would be wrong to suggest that the door was locked, but it would also be right to acknowledge that there was a lot of other challenges going on at that particular time. 
Thanks, Chris. And you can watch all of that podcast, including all the excuses, link below. And if you want to have your say, please use the comments below. Next up, Ian Hodge on night vision. Firmware has absolutely exploded in the last few years. And we do cover everything that you need from the uh, air gunner right up to long distance fox shooting. So an air gunner, if he or she came in and said, I'm only an air gunner, I'm shooting at 40 yards, 50 yards, tops, um, but I want to see what's about, then the Lynx is ideal. 370 pounds, you'll see what's about, and it's more than adequate for, for the range of an air gun. So that's our go-to one for, for air gun shooters. We can move up then to the Owl. That one you can see is, is more money, but you, you get more distance. It's, uh, the principle is the same, the, the housing is very similar, but it just takes you out further. So for, for spotting a fox absolutely hundreds and hundreds of meters, yards away, you know, you can pick cows out at three miles. So yeah, uh, it, it, it's brilliant. And then you move on to the, to the scopes. Thermal scopes now, all of them are just so much better than the original thermals. Now you can actually see what the animal is. Sometimes it was, yeah, there's something there, but I'm not sure what it is. And then you would look for a night vision to pick it out completely. Um, but the thermals now, are, it, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, as you see, you've seen on the Field Sports Channel, they're out and you can see it's a fox, you can see what it is. Now you're knocking on 3,000 quid, so they're pricey. Yeah, but it's, it's like with telescopic sights. You get what you pay for. The more you spend, the better the, better the quality and the, and the ease of using. So now we've got the range of heck here in their lovely display cabinet, but we also are the dealers for infrared. Again, the, the infrared is a fantastic, absolutely fantastic range of thermals. There's thermal and night vision. You've got, you've got the, uh, the pretty expensive uh, scope there. But as I said earlier, you get what you pay for. The clarity and the ease of use is, is, is unbelievable. And once you've used one, you won't go back to anything cheaper because it is so good. But we've got the smaller ones down here. I mean, that's an excellent unit, but it's nearly 2,000 pounds. Again, for the air gunner or short range stuff, we've got the uh, AP-13 there. Brilliant. And um, what other makes are there that compete with this? Well, obviously there's Infrared, um, the Hit Micro, Pulsar, obviously massive players in the whole thermal world and, and night vision world. Then we've got Pard, more budget end, but I use a Pard. Brilliant. So um, give me the kind of fox shooter's delight package. What would you choose for a fox shooter out of everything you've shown so far? For night vision for, uh, to, for fox shooting, I would go for this little package that uh, Infrared have put together here. Absolutely, we don't really know how they've done it for the money. You get a thermal spotter and, and you get your um, Infrared night vision scope. So spot with, the, spot with the thermal and then you've got the night vision scope there. Infrared torch, yeah, that goes on top, so that will help with the distance as well. Although these are very plain without, without one, but that will just give you that extra distance. It's just under £1,500 for all that. I think it would be about £300 extra if you bought everything individually. Is that a very, very generous Christmas present? It, it, it would be, and I, I think most people would love to have one. So, uh, although should we be talking about Christmas quite yet? <laughs> Thank you, Ian. And Ian Hodge Field Sports has an open day coming up on Saturday, the 16th of September, 2023. If you're in Cornwall or fancy a trip there, head over to Wadebridge. Now from Kit to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, brought to you by James Margington, it's Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube with James to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First this week, here's what can happen when a hunt goes wrong. The Clark boys are chasing after feral pigs with dogs in New Zealand. In the excitement, Harry runs into a tree and knocks himself cold, but they don't let that stop them. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, the locals are having trouble with a civet cat, which is killing and eating their chickens. So they call in the hunters to track it down with their dogs. Next, here's a new video from Shotcam, featuring dozens of shots at ducks filmed through their latest model of barrel camera. 
ready for seeing the lead required at different distances. Over to Qatar, where this stunning film was made to support their bid to have the Arabian Saluki hunting dog recognized by UNESCO as part of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Thanks to Ed Swales for sending that one in. Ryan Kirby is both a wildlife artist and a bow hunter, making him ideally placed to give this detailed rundown of deer anatomy and shot placement. He runs through every possible angle from broadside to quartering to the infamous Texas heart shot, and even shooting down from above the animal. Here's our gun shooter Jeff, who's recently launched a new channel called HFT Shooter. That stands for Hunter Field Target, a popular air gun competition discipline. In this film, he gives a beginner's guide to what it's all about and offers some useful tips on improving accuracy. From air guns to catapults, and Terry Danta sends in this one with Geordie Carnivore cooking up a huge roadkill venison kebab over the campfire and chatting about his experiences hunting with a catapult. And finally, this week, here's the latest in a series from Triple C Odyssey, making a compelling case for the role of hunting in the conservation of lions in Zimbabwe. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the i symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. And that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click the like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain, it's at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs>